This is Twit. Time for you to be an ally, Micah Sargent. Poor Aunt Pruitt. <laughs> How many years has Aunt used Windows? His whole life, right? You've been a Windows guy. Aunt is going to show us some of the issues he had transitioning to Mac. Watch. Hello, tech guys. I am Aunt Pruitt. I think you know who I am. I'm that guy that is the only person using Windows there at Twit. Yeah, that's me. Also host of Hands-On Photography. It's been a couple of weeks since I finally made the move from Windows to Mac OS. Um, you know, again, being the only person running Windows there at Twit. Uh, I've I, I got to say, I've always found Apple hardware to be pretty badass. It just, just looks so good and it seems to have all of the nice performance numbers, you know. Um, I've always thought Mac OS or OS X was pretty and I always thought it was smooth, you know, but I could never really dive into the world of OS X or now Mac OS until recently. Why couldn't I dive into it? Well, there's a couple of things. Um, two things actually. First, Apple computers, they, they never had enough ports on them. And coming from a Windows environment, I needed multiple USB ports for my peripherals. You have your keyboard, you have your mouse, you have your webcam, you have your direct access storage, you have thumb drives, you have audio interfaces like this here, um, and so on. Now, you need more than two or three USB ports on a laptop, clearly. At least I did. So that was one big thing. The second thing was the cost of Apple computers. Uh, they were always out of my budget. Yeah, I just, it, they just were. And then when it got to the point where they were in my budget, I still found the lack of ports and I found the lack of upgradability being a non-starter. Now, if I wanted to install a new graphics card or something, I couldn't do it. Now, I know that wasn't a big thing on the Mac side, so let's take a look at another example. I wanted to install some RAM on my computer. Couldn't do it. You, you just couldn't do it. I wanted to put, you know, an extra 32 gigs on myself. I couldn't do it. That was a problem. And it was, I was always curious about the Mac mini, you know, that small form factor. It looks great. It looked like it had plenty of horsepower, if you will. But again, it never had any ports on it. I need more ports. Now, fast forward to today, actually just a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, I got my hands on the new Mac mini, you know, when Apple announced the new Mac mini, it was, it, it not only brought up, uh, the next generation Apple Silicon, uh, but it also put some more ports on this device. And honestly, it still wasn't quite enough for me, but I thought I could get closer to it being something that, that would work for me. And in my price range, if I went and found some type of dock to give me some extra IO. And I did find a doc, which was discussed on This Week in Google. And for the most part, it's working okay. Now, with all of that said, <laughs> if I were uh, to, to, to go back in time and re redo all of this again, I would look for or maybe even create some type of primer that's based on going from Windows to Mac. Because right now, when I look out there for something that, that walks through the process of going from Windows to Mac, I get a whole lot of fanboy stuff. I don't want that. And it's just a whole lot of, oh, how great it is to be on Mac from Windows, you know, and I get that. People are going to be happy, but there's a couple of things that I've come across that just sort of bugged me. And I'm hoping that you, the tech guys, can help me out. So first, and there's four points. First is the notifications inside of Mac OS. Now look here, I can't stand the notifications on iOS. Absolutely hate them. I think they're just not functional at all. So then when I get into Mac OS, it's pretty much the same thing. I hate them. And so I spent a lot of time just trying to turn notifications off for different apps and things like that. And stuff still pop up and it just annoys me with all get out. So just, I need to find a way to get rid of notification because I, I, I just don't care. Uh, secondly, app installation on Mac OS. Now on Windows, things are pretty straightforward. You get an MSI or an EXE, you just click on it, boom, it runs and it does its thing to install whatever app you're trying to install. On the Mac side, you get some type of zip file or you get a DMG or you get a zip that's in the DMG and then you get the DM, no, you get a DMG that's in the zip. See, I'm already confused. And then you get the uh, option to drag said file into the applications folder, or you have to double click the DMG to make it do the installation. So it was a, 
It was a little bit confusing at first, but it was no big deal. That's just some extra muscle memory that I need to try to figure out. And then there's the dock in Mac OS. The dock is quite useful. You know, I guess it's useful enough for Microsoft to decide, hey, we want to put our stuff at the bottom just like a Mac does too. So I like the dock, but I don't care for the fact that I can have this bit of an OCD moment and see that some applications or services are running when I know they're closed. Well, the windows are closed at least. I don't like the fact that if I click on a window, it's like, I don't know. So let's say I open up Spotify and I'm listening to some music and I'm done listening to Spotify, stop the music, close the window there for Spotify, look down at my dock, it's still down there running. Okay, because that little white dot's there. Then I realized, oh yeah, you have to go to that top menu, hit file, quit, or whatever it is to stop whatever it is you're, you're running. Yeah, that's an extra step, an extra bit of muscle memory, but what's the point of having that little red dot there in the window to close the window if it's not gonna close the application? Or that's just my Windows brain coming through and battling here because in Windows, if I close the window, it closes the app, it closes the service 95% of the time, okay. But anyway, I I look here. I, I know this this sounds like I'm doing a bit of nitpicking, but yeah, I am actually. <laughs> Lastly, point number four, the file system of macOS. And this is probably the most important thing, the file system. So coming from Windows, I have a lot of external drives that were formatted in TFS. Oh boy, that's a problem when I plug it into this Mac. Why? Because I can read that data, but I can't write to those drives. That was, that was a bit of a problem for me. So now I'm stuck figuring out, okay, fortunately I have backups of these drives. So I'm just going to wipe these drives and format them to work in a read write uh, aspect for Mac OS. But then there's the, the, the idea of what format do I choose? Do I choose the Mac OS extended journal, Mac OS extended? Then there's the APFS, I believe it's what it's called. that just come out not too long ago from Apple. Um, or do I just use XFAT? I'm thinking I'll use XFAT because I still have a couple laptops that I use here from time to time. And I want to be able to still access those drives if I need to on a Windows device. So what are your thoughts on that? And then, oh yeah, that whole eject button, whatever inside of Finder, that's, why is that even there now? I thought that, you know, safely removing <laughs> drives was, was a thing of the past. But anyway, I'm done. Again, lastly, let me just say, I am quite happy with Mac OS. I am having a good time with this. It reminds me of my time with Ubuntu and GNOME, probably about 10 years ago when I played around with it in the house. Uh, I do enjoy having the additional desktops where I can switch through and work on things in another desktop virtually and just, you know, keep up with my productivity. But yeah, there's just a couple things that just sort of nitpick and I'd like to address, you know, such as snapping windows inside of a display. So if I want to work on one project on one side of the screen and compare it to the other side, I can, you know, there's a little nitpick stuff like that. But for the most part, this OS is so much better. I just grew tired of Windows being a crashing mess and having all of that hardware to, to still be a really, really bad experience from a performance standpoint. And, you know, even if I just wanted to shut down the laptop, it took a whole lot of cooling just to shut it down. Really? Fans are going to ramp up just to shut down? That's stupid, Microsoft. Do better. Sounds like a daggum B57 taking off, uh, 757 taking off. Anyway, so, um, yeah, that's it. I just wanted to share that with you all, and hopefully you can address those couple of bullet points that I have. Thank you for all you do for our community here, and um, appreciate all the help. Take care, gents. I appreciate you, Ant. That's yeah, great. Yeah, this is great. He this has a really good questions. point, and I think this is unfortunate that uh, when you go to look at Mac information, it tends to be a lot of fanboys, mm -hmm. right? And I think that that is a problem. It's a problem everywhere. Where you get people go, you know, it's not a religious war. Right. Saying, oh, Windows. Blah, blah, blah. And uh, and I don't blame Ant for being a little 
put off by that. Yeah, especially because most of those stories are this clickable, I've used Windows for years and I'm making the change and you'll yeah. never... No, people just... I, this is a question I do get a lot is, I'm making the change. What are some of the things that I need to know? And what I appreciate about what you've done, Ant, is you've actually given us some sort of common questions that yeah. a person might have. And I think now that's I use all. I use Mac, Windows, and Linux uh, uh, equally. Uh, so... I think it's possible not to abandon any one or right. you say, I'm going to be on Team Mac. You could just be on you know, Team PC or Team Smartphone. Uh, maybe that's a better team to be on than, than any particular operating system, especially as time goes by. Right. Because they're getting closer and closer to, uh, to each other. I, there is, that is the biggest uh, issue in, of incompatibility is file systems. And just real quickly to answer that uh, question, uh, you don't have to erase those NTFS drives. Please don't. You can add a driver to Macintosh to read and write NTFS. It can read them already. You probably noticed that. You can open them, but it won't write them. The most common choice is from Paragon Software. Uh, they've been making this for years. It is now, and one of the reasons I like it is M1 and M2 compatible. There's been a long time there's been a program called Fuse that was open source and free, but I don't know if Fuse has been updated to M1 or M2 compatibility. Paragon's not expensive. Uh, you buy it once, uh, and then you'll have it, uh, you know, forever. So if you have a lot of formatted drives, this is a problem for me, too, because I work in all three environments, so I have multiple file formats. Mm -hmm. I would also suggest for stuff you know you'll only use with a Mac, because only Macs, Macs can read it, APFS is the right choice. That's yes. the default choice. For instance, Time Machine works best with APFS. So if you're going to use Time Machine as your backup, have an APFS a configured drive but often because i'm using thumb drives that i'm moving around i'll use xfat same yeah. that's kind of a standard format that everything can read linux mac and windows it's not a, not the greatest file format ever right but it, uh, file system but at least you know it's compatible with everything so format your your usb thumb drives that you're going to move around xfat format the drives you're going to use with the mac only apfs and when you need to read those ntfs drives no need to erase them just use paragons uh, NTFS driver. It's an easy thing to install on Mac, and then you'll be able to read and write them. Beautiful. Uh, starting at the top with notifications, I think one thing that will help make it easier for you is when a notification pops up for the first time, go ahead and make your choices then. At any time when a notification pops up, you can right-click on that notification and you'll see the options for mute for one hour, mute for today, but there's also the turn off option. And so it will feel a little bit less unwieldy if you do it piece by piece as opposed to hopping in that notification page. So I gotta put into work now. Yes, put in the work now. So <laughs> if, if, if you stay or you can ready, run you do don't gotta disturb, get ready. Right? Can't um, you just run and do not you, disturb? You can run and do not disturb. That's what I do. But yeah. then, all, I mean, yes, that's, a, that's absolutely a possibility. But if you do that, there are times when a notification, because that's the thing, uh, Mac OS uses that notification method as the way of communicating about everything. So sometimes it is just an app being annoying and you can right click and choose turn off. But what if it's about a, uh, a specific application trying to let you know that something, you know, there was an error. And if you have it on Do Not Disturb, then suddenly you might not see that error because yeah. it didn't pop up as a prompt. So there are you kind of want those. Right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. running a backup and a backup fails or something. Exactly. Like that. And and yeah. the idea of always having Do Not Disturb turns on, it kind of runs contrary. Do Not Disturb is supposed to be kind of a I use this sometimes kind of thing. Mm. So, but again, totally up to you. But yes, if you do it piece by piece, that will feel a little bit less of a struggle. And then you're also getting the opportunity at that point to make those choices. The fourth setting in there is notification preferences and it will go directly to that app's notification preferences mm -hmm. so you can make those individual choices for that app so you get the option to say i don't ever want this to notify me at all or i want it to do a specific kind of notification mm -hmm. um i love the conversation about the, the, the second bullet which was app installation because yes <laughs> it is so different between windows and mac and there it's interesting because there are things that i like about windows with this and there are things that i like about mac with this I like Mac's uh, method of, I just have this application. I don't need to do anything behind the scenes. I just put it in the applications folder and that means it's ready. I like that part too. And I also like the fact that it says, okay, now that we've done installing this, can you just drag this to the trash? And yes, and how it does way? that automatically. That's beautiful. Yes. But everything doesn't do that. Right. And that, so yes, there, there are a couple of, uh, basically it's on the developer to make uh -huh. that work as it does. What um, on the Windows side, what I've always loved is, 
uninstalling. On Windows, you go through this process and it removes a bunch of the stuff. Yeah. On the Mac, there are times where I go, the way that you typically uninstall a program is you go into the applications folder, you right click on it, you delete it, or you just drag it to the trash. But there are still some files around in different places that may be part of that that you oh, lose. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and so I like to use a third-party application to do the uninstall management. Okay. Uh, it's a program called Clean My Mac, and um, you, as a member of the club, can check out uh, Hands On Mac, <laughs> where I talk all about Clean My Mac. Because it used to yeah. be that that program kind of got side-eye from people, but it's actually an excellent program that has some great tools in it. Um, so speaking of, of that still, yes, uh, most of the time it will have that uh, go ahead and throw it in the trash option. The reason why some of them don't do that is because there may be that when you do a restart, there's more that the program needs to do that has to install behind the scenes or other things where it's kind of got to play catch up a little bit later. Right. Uh, but then after that, going ahead and removing it is good. This episode of Tech Break is brought to you by ACI Learning. The most tech savvy people in the world serve in the military. And deciding how to transition to civilian life can be difficult. Before 2030, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported IT will add over 667,000 positions. Choose a career to support your goals with ACI Learning. Visit go.acilearning.com slash twit today. Hey. 